Hello, IBC Bond. This is Pastor Stephen here to talk to you about day six of the Passion Week. This is Friday. We find ourselves on what the Germans call Karfreitag, Wailing Friday, of course, referencing Christ's brutal death on the cross. We also, in English, call it Good Friday, which is a reference to the amazing spiritual benefits that this day has for all who believe in Christ. On this day, Jesus is tried. He is convicted, wrongly convicted. He is crucified, and his dead body is buried. It's a very busy day. Lots happens Uh, even before the sun rises. Um, It takes all four Gospels. Uh, As you see, here are the the biblical uh, references. Um, Those biblical references uh, where you find the the account of today. And it takes all of those uh, references, all of those four different Gospel perspectives to paint a complete picture of the events of today, It begins very early in the morning with Judas leading the temple police to the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. Judas ran away from the the Last Supper and went to the, um, uh, perhaps the high priest. He went somewhere and was uh, told to lead the, the temple police. These temple police were Roman soldiers given by Rome to the uh to the Sadducees, to guard the temple and to keep peace up on the Temple Mount. And and Judas is told to lead these soldiers to go collect Jesus. Judas uh, knew of the Garden of Gethsemane. The Gospels tell us that they had been there before. And so Judas knew that that was uh, a, a likely place to find Jesus. And so takes the, the guards, takes the police to the garden where he is arrested. From there, he is taken to the high priestly villa in, within the city gates of, of Jerusalem. This was a, a house where the high priest uh, lived and Jesus is taken there. And he will have uh, many trials there. At the high priestly villa, he'll have three trials there. But uh, we also learn from the Gospels that Simon, Peter, and John follow Jesus, led by the guards. And they go and they enter into the courtyard of the priest's villa. It's in this area where Peter warms himself by the fire. It's in this area where Peter is recognized. And all of this before the sun rises. But that first trial, Jesus is taken by the guards and he's taken before the former priest named Annas. And Annas is looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. And meanwhile, he is, uh, his, his goal is to bide his time, to waste time until the Sanhedrin can be gathered. The Sanhedrin is that the, the group of leaders of Israel, the spiritual leaders of Israel, and they have to be collected. They, they live in different parts of the city. And so the priests... Uh, servants are sent throughout to gather the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were looking for an opportunity to be, to uh, to have Jesus uh, arrested, but they didn't want to do it during the festival. They were afraid that it would result in riots because Jesus was so popular. And so they were surprised. They, they didn't know it was going to happen tonight. It wasn't their plan for it to happen on this day at this time. But Judas appeared and said that, that he could hand over Jesus. And so they, they took the opportunity. And now the Sanhedrin has to be gathered. And so Annas is, is wasting time until the Sanhedrin can be gathered. At that second trial of Jesus, Jesus stands before the Sanhedrin and they're bringing all kinds of false accusations and charges and they're bringing people who give false testimony and no, nothing is sticking and Jesus is remaining silent. And then at some point he, um, he's, he reveals that he is uh, the Son of God, the, uh, the King of Israel 
And so they decide to charge him with blasphemy. Around this time, uh, the sun rises and Peter out in the courtyard uh, denies Jesus for the third time and the rooster crows. Uh, one of the gospels says that Jesus looks over and makes eye contact with Peter. Having heard the, uh, the, uh, the rooster crowing, Jesus I, we don't know how he was looking, how he looked for him. Maybe he was being carried, led across the courtyard to another, uh, another room. Maybe he was able to look out of a window. We don't know. But Jesus and, and Peter make eye contact, and, and Peter runs away ashamed. Then there's a third trial. According to Jewish law, you couldn't have a trial uh, in the nighttime. It had to be in the daytime. And so they wait for the sun to rise and they do a, a quick trial after the sunrise. Uh, immediately at dawn, they bring the charge of blasphemy and Jesus is then taken to the Romans because they have decided that Jesus uh, has to pay for his crimes. Of course, uh, blasphemy is only uh, can only be punished if it's if the charge is true, and Jesus can't be accused of blasphemy uh, because, of course, his claims about himself are one hundred percent true. But they uh, they take him to um, Pilate. Pilate is the ruler of uh, of Judea. And Pilate doesn't want really to be involved at all. And so as soon as they tell Pilate that uh, Jesus has been uh, Jesus has been making claims about himself for all the way from his time in Galilee, uh, Pilate hears that word Galilee and says, oh, I, that's not my territory. That's not my my district. So I can't be the one to deal with this. And so Pilate, knowing that um, another ruler, a ruler named Herod, who is a ruler in Galilee, is actually in town. It turns out Herod is actually in town for the festival. And so Pilate has Jesus taken to Herod. But Herod is only interested in Jesus because he wants to see miracles. And so when Jesus doesn't perform any miracles, he sends him right back to Pilate for Pilate for his sixth trial. This is Jesus's sixth trial in a day. And throughout the whole time, he has remained quiet like a lamb before his shearers, um, waiting for uh, them to make their judgments. Jesus has created this event uh, through his own wisdom. He has ensured that this would happen. Um, it's at this time where Pilate again doesn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. Uh, Jesus says, don't worry. I mean, my kingdom is not of this world. Um, and Jesus uh, at one point says to Pilate, it's okay. It's not you who's done the wrong. It's those who have handed me over to you. It's as if Jesus says to him, Pilate, it's okay. You can have me crucified. Jesus is then scourged. He's whipped and beaten. Um, Pilate wants to please the crowds. And he thinks that if, uh, if Jesus, who he doesn't want to have crucified, he doesn't think it's right and just. He doesn't think that they have brought any crimes worthy of punishment. So he thinks if he has Jesus beaten, that the crowds will be happy. Uh, of course, by this time, the crowds have gathered. The Sanhedrin and those that they've brought together are uh, eager to, um, to have him crucified, not to have him beaten, but to have him crucified. And so the crowd cries out, crucify him, crucify him. At which point, Pilate washes his hands and he turns him over to be crucified. So the Roman soldiers take him and they mock him. They put a purple robe on him. They put a crown of thorns on him and they beat him and they mock him. At this point, the gospel writers tell us that Judas in his shame goes and hangs himself. Jesus then is the cross piece of his cross, the, the top piece where his hands will be uh, nailed. 
are, is put onto his back and he is, is forced to carry his cross out of the city gates into a hill called Golgotha, which is the place of the skull. Uh, it is a place outside of the city, a rocky outcrop, um, probably a place where stone has been mined away and uh, now has the, uh, the haggard appearance of a, of a skull. At 9 a.m., Jesus is nailed to the cross. His uh, outer garments are taken off. He's stripped naked. Uh, his arms are stretched out, and uh, the, the spikes are nailed into him uh, at 9 a.m. And by 3 p.m., Jesus dies, and his body will be buried uh, nearby in a tomb. As we look at Jesus' uh, time on the cross, uh, I want us to look at the seven sayings of Christ. While Christ is on the cross, he says seven things. The first one is, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. This is as Jesus is, is first on the cross. He asks his Father to forgive um, those who are crucifying him. He then um, looks at the, he, the Bible tells us that a man is crucified on his right and on his left. One, they are both criminals and one accuses Jesus and the other one defends Jesus. And Jesus uh, says to the man, today you will be with me in paradise. Looking down, um, Jesus um, Many of his disciples abandoned him, uh, but there is a group of women and at least one uh, disciple, John, at least one disciple who is nearby. And Jesus looks down at his mother and he looks at John and he says, woman, here is your son. And then to John, he says, here is your mother. He is telling John, John, please take care of my mother. A very sweet interaction between uh, an oldest child and his dear mother. And this is at midday, uh, and then from three, uh, from midday until three p.m. There is uh, the Bible says darkness. Darkness covers the face of the earth. And then in the afternoon. Jesus will cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, he is identifying with uh, David in Psalm 22. He's crying out to God, why have you forsaken me? Of course, we must understand that in the death, the, the, the Trinity is not torn apart. Uh, in, in death, Jesus is not uh, abandoned uh, by his father the way we might uh, think of abandonment. Um, but Jesus identifying with the experience of the psalmist in Psalm 22. And if you go and look at that, you'll see very clear connections to the crucifixion. Jesus is identifying with, with David, the psalmist, and, and he feels abandoned. He feels like he has been left to die. He feels like he has uh, lost that intimate relationship with the Father, that, that closeness with the Father. As, as the sin of the world is placed onto his shoulders, he feels um, something he's never felt before, and he feels forsaken. At which, um, some time later, he says in a quiet voice, I thirst. And then they, um, they put some vinegar onto a stick and give him something to drink. And why does he want something to drink? He, he is thirsty and what he wants to cry out is, it is finished. And that is what he wants to cry out. Uh, it is finished. His work um, his work in this mortal life um, leading to his death, his work is finished. The, uh, the death on the cross um, is, is finished and his work uh, pleasing to the Father is finished. And so the last thing he says is, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
And to your hands I commit my spirit. And then the gospel says that he uh, breathes his last and he gives up his spirit. At this point, uh, the earth shook. The veil of the temple was torn and the graves are opened and there are dead people coming out of the graves. An incredible uh, scene it must have been. An incredible moment to behold, to witness. But why does all this matter? What's the, uh, the impact for us as believers? Uh, why must we uh, see this as both a day of wailing and a day that is good for us? Well, the first thing is, uh, this is a long, uh, difficult phrase for non-English native speakers, but a substitutionary atonement. That means that Jesus died in our place and his death was an atonement for sins. His death was a pleasing um, sacrifice for sins. Jesus died the death that we deserve because sin, of course, we learn from the Old Testament, sin requires punishment. Sin requires uh, blood to be spilled in, uh, to cleanse the sinner. And Jesus' blood does just that. It cleanses the sinner. It makes atonement for the sinner. But he does it in our place. The death that we deserved, he did it in our place. Secondly, uh, um, Paul writes that the, the death of Christ brings us peace with God. The, the wrath that God has for sin, his hatred of sin, was, was poured out on, on the sin that Christ was bearing in our place. All that wrath was poured out on Christ. That now means that there is peace. Uh, there is a, the a potential for true peace between us and God. God, who formerly had been our accuser, now is our heavenly father. There is peace. And that also means that there can be peace between us, between people of different nations and, and backgrounds. There can be peace. It also means that there is a, a, the beginning of a new covenant, the inauguration of a new covenant. This is a huge uh, thing, and the lesson from the Old Testament is that, that blood is required when there's a new covenant. There must be blood, and for this covenant, the new covenant in Christ, the new covenant that we enjoy as followers of Christ is inaugurated by Christ's own blood. And another benefit, of course we could go on and on, but another benefit, Paul says that the, the, the cross is the power of God for all who believe. It also is our righteousness. Christ, the, the perfect lamb, the perfect, spotless, sinless sacrifice, offers us his righteousness, righteousness that doesn't belong to us. It isn't uh, come from us, but God offers us uh, the sacrifice, the Righteousness of Christ. Truly amazing results from this death, from his death. In our lesson for Saturday, we'll talk about what happens when Christ dies. And of course, we're building up to the amazing truth of Sunday. But let's not forget the fact that Christ died. He really died. Thank you for joining us on this journey. I pray that you will be blessed by meditating on the amazing events of this week. I hope that these videos have been illuminating to you, helpful to you. There's a lot of events and it's, it's certainly difficult to arrange them in our minds sometimes. I hope this has been helpful to you. God bless.